Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I know some of you were here last night. Some of you are back this morning. We are so pleased to have you on Petty Jean Mountain. And John, what a pleasure to welcome you to the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute. You have been here as our guest many times, uh, but today is very special because we have the privilege of um, sharing your life's work, really, uh, about Winthrop Rockefeller and his history and legacy and the magnificent work that you did in this book, which everyone has a copy of today from New Yorker to Arkansas. -er. I'm so excited to dig into this with you. And I just want to thank you um, on a personal level and on behalf of the Institute, because so much of what uh, we do here is informed by the story of Winthrop Rockefeller. And um, you know, until now, that story was only partially told. And thanks to you, you have really made whole um, his history, uh, in, both in New York and, and in Arkansas. So I really appreciate this and I'm looking forward to discussing it. I want to start off by um, just asking you to talk a little bit about what caused you to want to comb through tens of thousands of archival documents uh, to begin researching Winthrop Rockefeller and to write this book. Yeah. Well, thank you, Janet, for having me here today, and congratulations to you as well on becoming CEO, and uh, thanks to everyone for being here on this uh, Saturday morning, sunny Saturday morning on top of Petty Jean. It's fantastic to be here and to be talking about Winthrop Rockefeller in this very special place. I know the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute is particularly uh, interested in Winthrop's history and legacy, so it's a wonderful place to be talking about the book and completely appropriate place to, to be doing it. Um, I um, have been working on Arkansas history for many, many years now. Uh, a lot of my work was on the history of the civil rights movement, has been on the history of the civil rights movement in the state. Of course, uh, you know, um, Arkansas uh, is still known around the world as one of the major sites of the civil rights movement from 1957, the Little Rock School Crisis. I always tell my students that, you know, people outside of Arkansas know about three things about Arkansas if they know anything about the place, and that is the 57 school crisis, Bill Clinton, and Walmart. Now, nah, those are the kind of <laughs> Arkansas's holy trinity for the rest of the world. Um, and so uh, uh, that kind of interested me at first, and it was through my research on the history of the civil rights movement, really, that I came across Winthrop Rockefeller and thought he was uh, a very intriguing figure uh, in American history, not just Arkansas history, but American history as somebody who came from such a wealthy and powerful family and just up sticks in the mid-1950s and came to Arkansas and Moralton on Petty Jean Mountain and set up a new life here. It seems such a fascinating and compelling story and the impact that he had on the state and the state politics that, um, that um, when I had the opportunity to pursue that research, I, uh, I did it with gusto and I've been doing it for 12, 13 years now and this is a culmination of that research. Yeah. We're so glad. Uh, I've shared with you before that my predecessor and I uh, went to see Hamilton, the production of Hamilton on Broadway a few years ago. And um, for those of you who have seen it, it's really all about telling a full story of someone. And uh, we, after we saw the production, we said, oh, we we, we're waiting on John's book. We want John's book so that we can get the full story of Winthrop. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, just Winthrop's early life. And we, we know he was born into the Rockefeller family. We've, we've heard a lot about, you know, his brothers and the philanthropy. But tell us a little bit about just sort of the personal family dynamics and his early years and maybe what, what interested you most. Yeah, I mean, you know, Winthrop grew up in a very different kind of environment to the, the one he ended up living in here on top of the mountain. You know, he grew up in one of the most powerful families in the United States. Um, you know, he was born May 1st, 1912, born on West 54th Street in New York. And the place now uh, where he was born is part of the Museum of Modern Art um, at MoMA, uh, which his mother was uh, integral to founding. And uh, the family donated the land there to MoMA. So uh, you can't actually see his birthplace anymore, but it, it is there still on that land kind of as a spiritual kind of foundation there. And he grew up in one of the largest private residences in Manhattan uh, and uh, you know attended school at Lincoln School which was part of the uh, kind of laboratory school associated with Columbia University and a very experimental school and really thrived the, doing the practical work that the school did. The school was based on the ideas of John Dewey and the idea was that they would replace many of the elements of classical education with more hands-on practical work and Winthrop really 
kind of uh, flourished in doing that. And you know, one of the things I write about in the book is that one of the projects he did at Lincoln was uh, going to farms. Went to farms in the New York area, and you know, talked about farm work. And one of his seventh grade projects was uh, to explain how silos worked. And now we can see the silos here, you know, uh, as part of the legacy, ongoing legacy of the Rockefeller uh, family here. So it's uh, um, that was kind of influential. Then he went to uh, Loomis Institute in Connecticut as a, as a prep school and didn't flourish as well there. His, the, the, the practical side of things was always where Winthrop's strengths were. He didn't flourish academically for good reasons. Part of it was to do with his uh, dyslexia, which I talk about in the book, uh, which hasn't been discussed a, a huge amount in the past. But um, he struggled academically. He did get into Yale. Uh, but um, didn't flourish there at all and eventually resigned to go work appropriately enough in the Texas oil fields. So that was kind of his sort of practical view of the world and he went to do a, an apprenticeship working from the ground floor upwards and working his way through every phase of the industry from a general labor roustabout working in the oil fields of Texas um, up to junior executive level. Then uh, worked for Sconey Vacuum Oil Company which was the kind of derivative of uh, the New York derivative of the Standard Oil Company, which his grandfather had founded and which was the world's first multinational industry and you know, kind of still dominates the oil industry today. Many of the uh, big players in the oil industry today, like ExxonMobil, um, are derivatives of the Standard, oil, uh, uh, the Standard Oil Corporation, which of course was broken up in 1911 under, um, under uh, Teddy Roosevelt's trust busting efforts. But, uh, but um, you know, remain the kind of influential force in the oil industry throughout the 20th century. Uh, and uh, just leading up to the Second World War, uh, Winthrop toured uh, Europe. And just as the Second World War was breaking out, uh, out in Europe, he went to the Middle East and toured Europe and you know, had audiences with the King of Romania and the pr uh, Prime Minister of, uh, of Hungary and kind of got a first-hand insight into what was going on in Europe through the leaders there and came back determined to um, join the military and uh, enroll and help America's preparedness for the Second World War and enlisted in the military in January 1941, a full 12 months before America entered the war with Pearl Harbor. So uh, yeah, it was a, a fascinating early life with lots of twists and turns and uh, took many paths and roads that many others of his brothers and the Rockefeller family uh, didn't. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I wanted to talk about Loomis a little bit because I think that one of the stories that you know we often hear in Arkansas is sort of how Winthrop broke uh, the family sort of tradition. He was he broke the mold and um, pursued a different path for himself. And it's very clear when you read this book that that began to happen at an early age. Um, and it showed up at Loomis. And there's a there's a piece on I think page 41 here. Uh, uh, was it William Batchelder? Is that is that the right the Loomis headmaster? Know, yeah. And um, he, you know, he was in correspondence with Winthrop's father because the, the, the family really wanted him to excel academically and felt that, you know, this was part of the path that they had laid out for him. But the headmaster was in correspondence almost regularly with John Jr., right, to talk about what he saw as Winthrop's gifts, which were not academic. And um, that you write on page 41 that uh, he recommended to Jr. that Winthrop should spend the first half of the year in travel or work, perhaps in your office or on one of your projects to gain practical experience. Um, he said he thought that it was elsewhere that Winthrop could best de deploy his extraordinary gifts. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what those extraordinary gifts were in that early time that they saw at Looms? Yeah, I and mean, uh, you know, Winthrop did not excel as a scholar at school and he understood that himself and later, you know, fully admitted that and acknowledged that. But he did have this kind of uh, practical sense about him. And at Loomis, he was the kind of life and soul of the school. And he did all kinds of things. He helped, you know, he set up his own barbershop at one point. He uh, helped to fund uh, tennis courts. He helped to fund the kind of dance at the end of school year. And he was a kind of life and soul and a leader in the place, really. All, if, if not kind of uh, scholarly adept, then he had this leadership role that he played at the school. and he. Uh, he ended up um, graduating with the school's highest award that they called the uh, 
um, Manliness Industry and Loyalty Award at the time, <laughs> uh, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, but he, w he won that award. Um, and his brother, his older brother, John, uh, John D. Rockefeller III, uh, went to the same school and didn't win the award, so remained jealous of Winthrop for that for the rest of his life, that uh, his, brother, his younger brother had won that award. So that was one that uh, Winthrop had over the other brothers. Uh, so yeah, he, uh, he thrived in those kind of practical, uh, hands-on kind of experiences, and that was really a characteristic throughout his life. You know, that not the, he, a lot of his brothers, you know, and he was one of five brothers, he had five brothers and one sister, and they all went on to stellar careers, but they were, you know, kind of desk people pulling the strings behind the scenes, and Winthrop always wanted to be up front on the ground floor, uh, you know, doing work with his hands and kind of in a very practical way. So he's very different from the rest of the brothers in that sense, and that set him off on a trajectory for very different sorts of uh, experiences that his brothers would largely have never really thought of doing. I uh, was interested to read about the tennis courts. So there was, he set up an endowment, right? He organized um, very early when he was at, at Loomis an endowment fund and raised money for the school. Um, and I, I don't think that was his first foray into philanthropy, but certainly an indication that he had um, a heart for it. You wanna talk a little bit about how his parents and his family um, encouraged that philanthropic uh, part of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, from a very early age, um, Winthrop grew up in this um, philanthropic family and John D. Rockefeller Sr., or Sr. as they call him in the family, uh, was kind of the archetype, uh, architect of modern day philanthropy. He uh, was known in the first part of his life as a so-called one of the robber barons of the Gilded Age and, you know, founded this huge fortune uh, with Standard Oil and it was finally broken up in 1911, just a year before Winthrop was born. And Winthrop grew up in the kind of second half of his grandfather's life in which he became a philanthropist and gave away a huge amount of his uh, wealth that he'd accumulated. And um, his father kind of took on the mantle, John D. Rockefeller Jr., Jr., as they called him in the family. Um, and he took on the mantle for uh, the philanthropy, he was more adept at that than the, the business side of things and Junior was very much into the kind of growing the phil uh, philanthropic side of the family's interests and encouraged the boys uh, and the so-called brothers generation of the family and there was a sister who was the eldest of them, Babs, who kind of with the gender roles at the time kind of got sidelined very early on and we think about the Rockefellers being the five brothers but she deserves acknowledgement and mention as well. But the, among the five brothers, uh, you know, uh, they were encouraged from a very early age to uh, be entrepreneurs. They uh, raised rabbits for the Rockefeller Medical Institute and they did all kinds of other things, attended their own plots in the garden, uh, you know, were encouraged to kind of take responsibility for themselves, uh, uh, learn to sail. They used to spend the summers at the Erie, their home in, uh, in Seal Harbor in Maine and they uh, learned to sail and they didn't have a engine in their boats like many of the others did because they wanted to learn to do it with their own hands and kind of be a practical kind of way of uh, understanding and learning self-sufficiency. So from a very early age, they were taught these kinds of hands-on self-responsibility kind of chores that they had. And, you know, um, they would spend Wednesday evenings was, would be devoted to the boys cooking. So the boys would cook for the family every uh, Wednesday evening and they'd have to get the produce, buy the produce, cook it, clean up and do all that kind of thing afterwards. So he very much encouraged this kind of hands-on approach um, so that they would appreciate the different things that different people who ran their household did. When Winthrop, uh, you mentioned, went to Loomis and uh, this was in preparation to enter Yale um, at, in his uh, collegiate career. And there's a, I thought this was really interesting because one of the things we'll do today is just encourage people to reflect on, you know, what, <clears throat> to reflect on their own lives and, and leadership. And Winthrop was doing that very young, I think possibly because the family was very good at cataloging their lives and, and, and writing everything down, documenting it. But there's a, um, you write about this letter um, that he, Winthrop writes to his father um, because his father says, you know, I, I understand that maybe this isn't the path for you, this academic path, uh, but I, but I want to support you in finding your purpose, and I'm paraphrasing. And Winthrop writes back to him and says, what is going to be my life work, my interest in people, 
has made me think that I could be a useful citizen in politics or some public service. On the other hand, my pleasure in developing things makes me wonder whether I could not be happier and of more use to you in helping relieve some of your burdens by going into business. Um, I wonder wh how, what you make of that self-reflection that he did about what, he, what path that he should take. What did you learn about that in this writing? The brothers sort of worked together thinking about where they would fit with one another's interests. Um, and they kind of split the, what they did between them. So, you know, John D. Rockefeller III uh, took over the philanthropic interests of the family and went on to be president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, Nelson was a family politician, second born, and of course went on to be probably the most famous, uh, publicly famous of the, of the five sons uh, as governor of New York and then as vice president for uh, Gerald Ford in the 1970s. Uh, Lawrence was the businessman and entrepreneur who owned Eastern Airlines and then later in his life um, uh, worked as a conservationist. Uh, David was the banker in the family and the financi financier and was uh, CEO of Chase Manhattan Bank for most of the 1970s. So they all held these prominent roles and Winthrop tried to find his place in that, which is, you know, a, a difficult ferment to find your place in when you have such a high powered family doing all those different kinds of things. And Winthrop kind of struggled to find his place and think, well, where do I fit into these things? And, you know, where's my place? Um, interestingly, one of the things that he was doing uh, after the Second World War, and one of, the, one of the places that he found his niche was in race relations and working with the National Urban League. And, you know, he um, told the newspapers after the Second World War that he was the family's representative in terms of dealing as a spokesman for issues of race relations and the family's interest in that sector. So that's kind of fascinating that he saw himself in that way before he moved to Arkansas. And his move to Arkansas kind of changed things a little bit and he, it, with a new kind of... Uh, place, he had a new kinds of sets of priorities, but his interest in race relations continued through and we know a lot about what he did in Arkansas and we know, that, for example, that one of the defining moments of Rockefeller's term in office as governor was just after Martin Luther King's assassination, where Rockefeller was the only Southern governor to prominently participate in a memorial service to uh, Martin Luther King just several days after his assassination on the steps of the state capitol. Uh, but um, as the book talks about, that was kind of part of a lifelong commitment to um, race relations and working in the area of civil rights and doing all those kinds of things. So, you know, there's all kinds of fascinating continuities, I think. And one of the things the book does uh, help us with, I think, is tie those things that we know about his Arkansas life and see those threads that came through, you know, in the very early years and connect the two and show how those themes kind of were part of his whole life story, not just uh, what he did in Arkansas. Yeah. That's actually a great segue to what I wanted to ask you about next, because you mentioned and touched on uh, Winthrop entering work in the oil fields. Uh, and, you know, this was a very extensive sort of apprenticeship, I think you could say for him, uh, learning all facets of the, the business. Uh, but it's where he really distinguished himself another place from the rest of his family. And um, again, you have, you have uh, the, I, I guess the foreman, I can't remember his title exactly, but writing to Winthrop's father and mother to, to, um, to sort of celebrate his accomplishments in the oil field and, and what a, a great addition he was. Um, the, he, he, you write in the book that they received so many glowing testimonies from how he just sort of dug in as a, as a roustabout and then as a roughneck and doing some of the other um, exploration that he did. It's a, it, he, they say, Winthrop holds the affection and respect of all with whom he comes into contact. He is just as much at home in the ditch on the derrick floor or in the field as he is in the offices and homes of the executives. And he makes friends with all in both groups with equal facility. You know, that again, that is a thread because if you spend very much time on Petty Jean Mountain or in e anywhere in Arkansas, really, someone will come to you and say, I met Winthrop Rockefeller and I had no idea that it was him. It was, you know, he was in his khakis and his, his work clothes, and, but he would come up to me and introduce himself. And so that, that way of sort of endearing himself to, to people, um, I think was showing up early. And I, I, so I love that thread tying back all the way to the oil fields. Talk a little bit about what that work meant to him as you learned from writing this book. You know, when uh, Winthrop went to the oil fields, spent almost three years there, um, 
it was a break from the family. I mean, it was an escape, you know. Uh, if you look at the book, and as you were alluding to, you know, his father was, you know, his, his teachers would write to his father about his reports from school, and he'd have these eyes on him all the time. And, you know, Junior uh, was um, a micromanager, I guess we would call today. And, uh, you know, he was always kind of had his eyes on Winthrop and his sons. He was always very careful about what they were doing. I think to Winthrop, going to the oil fields to one degree, uh, helped him escape that oversight for a while and gave him a kind of freedom and a distance from his family that allowed him to find himself and flourish in his own right rather than being constantly managed by somebody else. And uh, although, you know, there's, there's this kind of funny letters that uh, Junior uh, and Abby, his, uh, his mother, exchange with Winthrop when he's in the oil fields and Junior is always probing to see what he's doing and what's going on and what he's up to. And, you know, Winthrop is careful not to give too much away about what, what his day-to-day -day activities. But, um, but it's a great sense of freedom. And, uh, you know, the Winthrop distinguished himself, I think, was different from the other brothers by having this sort of common touch, I think we'd call it. You know, he could relate to a much wider range of people than his brothers could. And that started from very early on in his life, I think. You know, one of the things that Winthrop uh, dealt with very early on in his life was bullying from his brothers. Um, you know, Lawrence and Nelson in particular, his older brothers, used to sort of bully Winthrop and, you know, he'd be the, f the fourth son and kind of he would be the birth of all their jokes and all that kind of thing. And that kind of, you know, began, I think, his estrangement from the rest of the family and his, his kind of willingness to move outside that family circle and find friends elsewhere. And, you know, we find out that Winthrop often played with the, uh, the sons of the groundspeople on his grandfather's estate at the weekends and, you know, um, played with the sons and daughters of the chauffeurs when he was on the, holi on the summer holidays uh, out at the Erie in, 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 Seal, in uh, Bar Seal Harbour. Um, so from a very early age, he was kind of mixing with people who were outside the orbit of many of his brothers and much of the rest of the family and, you know, beginning to uh, cultivate relationships with those people. And so he was much more comfortable being able to go into places like the Texas oil fields and, you know, stay in company bunkhouses with, you know, the regular roustabout laborers and get along with them and enjoy being in their company. And that's something quite different that his brothers probably could never have done. I mean, his four brothers, you know, would not have wanted to do that and probably weren't equipped to do that, and Winthrop was. And they understood that to some degree. You know, there's an interesting quote from Nelson where he says, you have talents that, you know, none of the rest of the family have. And I think that's what he was alluding to, the fact that, you know, Winthrop had this, you know, populist strand to could connect with people and a wide variety of people in ways that his brothers really couldn't. And that was another thing that sort of marked him out as a quite different set of, skills and talents that he had from the rest of the family and his brothers. I'm glad you mentioned that quote because I had it marked here. Uh, that was your book finally redeemed Nelson for me uh, because I, Nelson was not, he, they were, Nelson and, and Lawrence were uh, teased Winthrop a lot when he was young and um, I was always sort of mad at him about that. Um, but I see there's some places in this book where you can see this real af affinity and admiration from Nelson in particular um, for Winthrop's work both in the oil fields and then as he entered uh, service in the military. And so I'm, I'm glad that you wrote about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, John, what, what if you had the opportunity to, um, to sort of sit down with, with Winthrop at this moment and, and ask any question or anything that still puzzled you after researching this early part of his life, what would you be curious about? Um, well, you know, my own affinity with uh, race relations and civil rights, I think that would be an interesting conversation to have with him and, you know, his kind of commitment to that. I think part of, you know, his uh, interest in civil rights and race relations stem from his own uh, marginalization in the family from an early age and, you know, his kind of feeling of uh, sort of uh, being um, an underdog in the family, I guess, you know, the one who was kind of put to one side the most. And I think that gave him an affinity with other marginalized people and, you know, an affinity with the idea of the underdog and the idea of, you know, the marginalized people in society. And I think, you know, that, that kind of sat with him from a young age and allowed him to understand what it felt like to be, um, you know, uh, put in a different, cast in a different way and cast in a different kind of, um, um, apart from the mainstream of the family. And, uh, you know, I think that kind of 
imbued with him from a, a young age too. Yeah, and the and the Hampton Institute. There were there were visits, uh, m multiple visits, I think, from by the family to the Hampton Institute, which also helped shape uh, the way in which he connected with uh, race relations and the need for improved race relations, at least at that point in his life. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the family had quite a long um, connection with race relations. Uh, his, uh, it's rumored that his, um, his uh, grandfather, John D. Rockefeller Sr., one of his first acts of philanthropy was to uh, gift money to an African-American man so that he could buy his wife out of slavery. Um, on uh, his grandmother's side, um, uh, his great-grandparents were conductors on the so-called Underground Railroad, which helped enslave people to escape from the South. And they were part of the Spelman side of the family. And of course, today, the Spelman, uh, Spelman University in Atlanta is one of the leading um, African-American HBCU um, institutions for black women. Uh, in the arts and humanities. And, you know, Winthrop Rockefeller's grandmother's name is given to this landmark black institution that still exists today. And the Rockefeller Family Foundation uh, gave a lot of money to construct uh, African-American schools in the South. Um, uh, Junie was heavily involved with HBCUs, the United Negro College Fund, and played an instrumental role in helping to set up and fund that. So the family itself had quite a strong sort of commitment to race relations and there were, you know, Northern Baptists and strong abolitionists during uh, the lead up to the Civil War. So there's quite a long family tradition that Winthrop's interest in race relations built upon and kind of, you know, was, uh, was already instilled in him uh, through the various family connections from quite an early age. Thank you, John. We're, we have covered sort of the first uh, roughly half of the, the book in terms of Winthrop's uh, trajectory. And I think we're going to pause here, right? Four questions, is that? Well, one of the things